Hey guys, my name is James Walsh, and you are listening to the Wrestling Epicenter here on YouTube. I want to thank you for finding us. Please do me a favor and click that subscribe button and the notifications bell. If you get the chance on this video, click the like button. If you do, it'll turn blue. Check it out. Also, check out WrestlingEpicenter.com for all this great content available in MP3 format, our online store that'll keep us going free and clear, daily news updates, as well as all the information from the history of professional wrestling you could possibly ever want. Check out WrestlingEpicenter.com online right now. Without any delay, let's get to your interview here on the Wrestling Epicenter. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Interactive Interview on the InteractiveInterview.com. Today's guest, the Raging Cajun, Lash LaRue. Lash, how you doing? I am tremendous. And by the way there, James, that is the Raging, my God, Cajun. <laughs> Thanks for correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what can I do? Hmm. Uh, first question I have for you is pretty blanket. It's, were you a wrestling fan growing up? I was a huge wrestling fan when I was a lot younger. Uh, as I got into high school and, and got a little bit older, I got away from it not so much because I wasn't a fan, but I was just so busy with working a lot of odd jobs and playing football and, and doing some amateur wrestling that I just really didn't have time for it. It was later on in college that I fell back in love with it. Mm -hmm. Who were some of your favorites, I guess, at both times, both when you were a kid and I guess when you started getting back into it in college? Well, I was I kind of came in at that unique time that, that they really had a nice crossover. Uh when I was really young, I was a big fan of Hulk Hogan, like you know many people in my generation, of course. Yep. Uh, Ric Flair, the Four Horsemen, loved them. Dusty Rhodes, uh, you know the Road Warriors. Uh, big fan of all the old school guys that you can imagine, like that. The guys that really busting their butt going out there, and and really here in the South also, it was a strong uh, stronghold for Bullet Bob Armstrong. So I was a huge fan of the Armstrongs too. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to want to get back involved or involved in wrestling in the ring? Actually, it was a freak thing, man. I, uh, do, you, do you mean now or do you mean when I first started in wrestling? When you first started, I guess. Yeah, when I first started in wrestling, it, it, was, it was kind of a freak thing, man. I mean, I, uh, I graduated from high school. I went to college. I was studying pre-med. I wanted to be a doctor. And I did a lot of the cartoons on the side still even then. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I really enjoy educating myself, you know, on anything that I'm interested in, whether it's artwork or whatever else. And, and I had gotten a lot of books and was reading up on selling cartoons. Mm -hmm. So I decided to take a semester off from college and try to sell my cartoons and see if I could make any money at that. And that's when I started watching wrestling again. And it was about the same time the NWO had just hit, uh, WCW was going strong, and they had started the power plant. Right. And I saw a couple of the promos, uh, some of the advertisements for the power plant, on Monday Nitro, and I thought, you know, I keep myself in pretty decent shape. I wrestled in high school and did pretty well amateur-wise, so I thought I would try out. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Hmm. Who were some of your trainers in the power plant? Oh, uh, the original assassin, Cody Hamilton, which is Nick Patrick's dad. Mm -hmm. He was kind of over the whole thing there. Uh, Sarge, Buddy Lee Parker, mm -hmm. that trained Goldberg and uh, a lot of those big-name guys like that that came to the power plant. Uh, Pistol Pez Watley and a guy by the name of Mike Winter. Mm. But the great thing about being a part of the WCW and being at the power plant there in Atlanta was that a lot of the wrestlers there for WCW would come through there all the time. So you had a great opportunity to learn a lot from, you know, every different person you could think of. Mm. Mm. Uh, a fan from the forums, Lloyd, is sending in a question. He wants to know, the first time he saw you was a match against Billy Kidman. He believes it might have been your debut in, on TV. First of all, um, how did you enjoy working with Kidman? And secondly, what was your debut like? How were you feeling? What was going through your mind? Oh, brother, it was most likely my Nitro debut in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't, I'll never forget that because it was my actual first Nitro match. It was my first live match. I had done some... Uh, some worldwide matches and some WCW Saturday night matches before then. Right. But they had just kind of called me out of the blue, man, and said, uh, we want you to have this match with Billy Kidman uh, for the Bruiserweight title. Uh, kind of threw me out there and gave me a great opportunity. And, you know, Billy Kidman's a great guy, a uh, tremendous athlete, and I was very fortunate to, to, to be able to step in there with him and have a great match. And because of that match that we had, uh, they were impressed. They being the office of WCW, and 
from then on, man, I went from just being some trainee at the power plant to they kept me on the road, and, and I was on tour with everybody else from then on. Mm. One of the first angles you did was with the Disco Inferno. You faced him at Halloween Havoc, and then they eventually teamed you guys up. How did you get along with Glenn Gilbert at the Disco Inferno? Got along with him great, man. I think he's one of the most entertaining guys in our business. And uh, he's not the most athletic person in the world, but he has such great entertaining matches and smart matches. I mean, he wrestles a very intelligent match, whether you like him or you don't like him. Mm -hmm. So that makes him a tough competitor, you know, regardless of the situation. And so uh, I always enjoyed working with him, teaming up with him. Even when we had to face each other, we always had some great matches. And they seem to be pretty memorable. I mean, you know, fans still ask me about them now. So mm. I'm, I'm a proud of a lot of those matches. Mm. When you were doing your angle with uh, the Mamelukes, you were under the command, I guess you would say, of Vince Russo, who was running the TV back then. How'd you get along with Vince Russo? Got along great with Vince Russo. I still do now. I've, I've seen him, you know, recently backstage in a lot of the TNA shows. Mm -hmm. And I uh, always thought Vince was a very creative guy. He was a very fair guy. And he would sit me down and uh, personally let me know exactly where I stood. And you know what, whether you like me or you don't like me, that's all I would ever ask out of anybody. Hey, be straight up with me if you think there's a spot for me. If you don't think there's a spot for me, you know, either way, as long as you're honest. And one thing I have to get to Vince Russo, he was always honest with me. Mm -hmm. In early 2000, uh, Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, those guys left. And Vince Russo was pretty much taken out of power with Kevin Sullivan being put back as Booker. Uh, you were backstage at the locker room at that point. Was was the change in the locker room? Uh, I've, I've heard stories from guests that were on the show that said that the locker room morale was low at that point. Would you say that was a fair statement? Uh, I think the locker room morale, you know, constantly went on a roller coaster ride. To be honest, mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't so much because it was directed at anyone personally. Uh, is my opinion. I, I think it was more so just because you're sitting here working for a great company that really you're afraid they don't know which direction they really want to commit themselves to go in. Right. So I think because of that, you know, that was the reason for the morale going up and down. As far as the politics or lack thereof or whatever else, I'll be honest with you, I was never one that really felt like I was affected by the politics. And, and I was brought into this business to believe that if you always worked hard, if you were a good talent and, and you didn't try to play those kind of political games, then you would always have an opportunity, you'd always have a job. And I was just happy to be a part of the company, man. I, I didn't like to play any of those kind of games. I really did put myself around people that did play those kind of games. And uh, because of that, I was fortunate enough that I would just show up. I would do my job, and I was taken care of by WCW, and, and I was happy to be there. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, I, I didn't get caught up in that. And my opinion is once you let yourself get caught up in those kind of, you know, political backstabbing games or whatever else people may think are going on, you know, once you let yourself get caught up in that, sooner or later it's going to come back to bite you in the butt. You know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. So I just like to do the best I can do uh, as far as being the best wrestler and the best talent I can be, regardless of who, who I, who's in charge. And I, it was a pleasure for me to work with all of them. Mm -hmm. You worked with Prince Iakea in Super Bowl, I guess this was 2000. Yeah, Super Bowl 2000, you worked <laughs> Prince Iakea. Whatever happened to him? That's my question. Now, I cannot confirm or deny this, but the latest rumor that I had gotten, and this was uh, several years ago, this was right after WCW was bought, uh -huh. uh, I had heard a rumor that he lived, and I knew he lived in Florida, I think around the Tampa area or something. And by the way, he was a good friend of mine and a great guy. I mean, I learned a lot from some of the great matches I had with him. Mm -hmm. But I had, learned, I had heard that he had won the lottery, and so he kind of retired. You know, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I haven't really seen him out on the wrestling circuit, you know, any, so I got to assume he's doing something like that. But, you know, if he did win the lottery, God love him. There's not anybody I can think of that deserves it more. <laughs> that's cool to hear. Did you think when they brought Bischoff and Russo back together that it was going to work? I really did, man, and I, and I, and I thought it was going to work just simply because I thought we had a great company. I <laughs> thought we had a great uh, roster of talent. And, you know, a lot of people wanted to second guess, you know, all those, all those kind of thoughts and stuff back then. And they wanted to play armchair quarterback and say, well, you should have been doing this or this could have been on the show. But, you know, now looking back, I'm sure there's a lot of people going, God, I wish there was a WCW around. Yeah, absolutely. You know I mean? And, and so yeah, it's kind of one of those things you don't know what you're missing until it's gone. Yeah, that's a great song, too. <laughs> 
I'm, di- I'm dating myself when I say that. Okay. Um. Yeah, and I'm afraid you are because I'll be honest with you, I was clueless. Not to hurt your feelings, but I was clueless on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Misfits in action. Um, what was your initial opinions when they pitched this idea to you? Well, I mean, I'll be honest with you. We were just happy to be you. Uh, we were set down by, by Vince Russo, and basically he said, uh, you are a group of very talented guys. We, we, we don't want to send you home and not be using you. But at the same time, we don't really have room for everyone individually on the show. Here's, here's this idea we want to throw on you guys. And, uh, basically you're going to be the comic relief of WCW. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were happy to do it. And the fact that we really weren't, we weren't meant to become popular. We weren't meant to do anything other than just be a little bit of, uh, cheap entertainment. Mm. And the fact that it got over and the fans got behind it and the fans still remember it and they loved it, I think is just a tribute to the talent of, of not me, not me just patting myself on the back, but God love him, Jerry Wall, uh, right. Jerry Suit, the Wall, uh, Hugh Morris, Chavo. I think it was just a tribute to the talent of the guys that were involved and I was very proud to be a part of it. Yeah, you just mentioned him. That's my next question. What are your thoughts and memories of the Wall? And he was a tremendous guy and I had never met anyone you know, that size whose heart was as big as he was. Mm. I mean, and, uh, that to, to lose him so soon was, you know, it, it, it's another hole in your heart, man. And, and unfortunately, it, it seems to happen more often than we would like for it to in this business. And you lose a lot of good friends and, you know, uh, you, you never get used to it. No matter how many guys that you lose, you know, you, when you're, when you're on, on the road, like we're on the road, you're traveling. You see each other a lot more often than you see your family. Yep. And if you didn't have each other, you wouldn't have anything. So you become really, really close on the road, man. And when you lose someone like that, it's like losing a member of your family. Mm. And uh, I hated it when it happened. I hated it when I got the news. And, you know, unfortunately, all I can do is pray every day and hope I'll get to see him in a better place someday. Absolutely. Absolutely. When did you start to think WCW is on its decline? I, I never saw it. You never saw it? A lot of people. No, I'll be honest. I'm not going to be completely naive about it. I really thought that when they canceled the Saturday night show, that that was a tough move simply because, to me, if you if you do have problems and you do want to make some cuts here and there, I don't think that you start at the foundation. And basically, WCW Saturday night was the foundation of this whole, whole big company. Right. I mean, you back know? way back when, that was the only show they had. Exactly, and everything else is an extension of that. Right. So in my opinion, if you start making cuts, I say maybe you should cut from 12 pay-per-views down to six pay-per-views a, a year, you know, and then if you've got to cut more than that, well, then maybe Thunder goes or something like that. When you cut the Saturday night show, which is, you know, the mothership, if you will, <laughs> and I think that you kind of set up everything else to kind of collapse. But, you know, up till then, I think that it was in the back of everybody's mind that, hey, business is down, but it's going to pull through. And mm. we really thought that right up to the end. Mm. Mm. Were you at the last Nitro? No, I was not. Uh, ironically enough, I had been uh, I'd been home for about three weeks. They had had an idea to bring me in after the MIA thing. Mm-hmm. They asked me to cut my hair. Uh, to lean up as much as I possibly could uh-huh. and to bring me back as strictly a cruiserweight and give me another strong run there. So I came home. I had lost 30 pounds in about three weeks. <laughs> I cut my hair short. So I looked a lot different, you know, and, uh, boom, I sit at home. Believe it or not, even though I was sitting here working for the company, I sat at home and found out about it when all the other wrestling fans found out about it. And that was watching it live on TV. Oh, wow. What yeah. was going through your head when you saw that? Uh, I'll be honest with you. There's that part of you that, that shocked, of course, but at the same time, you stay around this business long enough and you realize that anything can and does happen. Mm. And so, you know, it, it's not like you're sitting there going, I can't believe this has happened. Uh, realistically, anything can happen at any time. Mm-hmm. Was your contract picked up by the WWE? Yeah. In fact, uh, ironically enough, uh, a lot of fans are shocked when they hear this, but I was one of the first 24 guys that they signed over. Uh, you know, I still have fans coming up to me now going, you know, when are you going to go with WWE? But I was one of the first 24 they signed over. Hmm. How can they never, uh, well, I mean, obviously they brought some of the guys on. They brought Shane Helms and, and guys of that nature on the show, but how can they never seem to put you on the, uh, television shows? Well, I'll be honest with you, James. Uh, that's the million dollar question. Uh, 
I, I don't have any bitterness towards anybody. Uh, I was happy that, you know, I, I was proud that they thought enough of my talent to bring me over there. Uh, but the truth of the matter is I signed with them. I took a huge pay cut to go up there to try to prove that I want to be part of the team when I could have set out, you know, my contract like a lot of the guys did. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to prove to Vince and them that, that I really wanted to be a part of that family. And after I signed a new contract with them, they asked me to go to Cincinnati for about three weeks, so they were ready to bring me on TV because they loved my character. They loved the Raging Cajun because mm-hmm. that's me. You know what I mean? Just the extension of me. Right. So they sent me to HWA uh, for what would be three weeks and actually wound up being there for about nine months. Huh. And mm-hmm. after nine months, I just think it became apparent to them that they really didn't see themselves using me anytime soon. And I... Personally, I think it was a situation not where they were after Lash or they wanted to get rid of Lash. I think it was just a situation where they had so much talent that they just didn't have room for everybody. And unfortunately, I was one of the ones that that uh, had to move along. Mm. Uh, I had a guaranteed contract with them for three years, so it had to be a mutual you know, uh, agreement for me to leave, but it still didn't work out. I wish it had. I would love to go back tomorrow, you know, and Mm. I would like to think that I'm still young enough that I'll get another opportunity. Mm. Uh, Only time will tell, though. Mm. How'd you enjoy working under Les Les Thatcher? Um, I I thought Les was a great guy, and I have a lot of respect for him. The fact that he was able to turn out as much talent as he did was, uh, you know, a testament to what he's been able to accomplish in this business. But at the same time, I just think that it was just an over... uh, uh, you know, just an overwhelming amount of guys up there and so much talent and, and nothing really to do with them. Mm-hmm. I mean, the truth of the matter is that while I was up there in HWA, you had maybe 24 wrestling superstars up there. I'm not talking about guys under developmental te- contracts. I'm not talking about just uh, less of students. I'm talking you had probably 24 guys that had been on TV. Right. And, you know, you know, working this little territory. So, you know, I'm not, I mean, that's a great thing, I guess, for the guy that's running the territory. But unfortunately, it's just, it's, it's tough to believe that you can't find a place for these guys. But then again, that just proves the point that I was saying earlier that obviously you, you had more talent than you had, you know, room to do anything with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, last year, you did a TNA explosion taping and you had a match with Chris Harris. Um, you mentioned also that you were backstage at a couple of TNAs. Do you have any plans of ever going to TNA full-time? Well, unfortunately, James, the ball's not my court. The ball's in their court. Right. Uh, you know, strangely enough, that's why this business works a lot of times. You can be the most willing guy in the world, and you can think to yourself, uh, well, I, I would like to think that I had some kind of name recognition and that fans would remember me and that sort of thing. But, you know, unfortunately, it was a situation where TNA didn't seem as interested as I was. Mm. Uh, I'll, I actually... I live about four hours from Nashville, mm-hmm. and I went to the shows every week, uh, you know, paying my own expenses for about eight months straight. Mm. And that's why I saw so many people in the back, you know. But uh, and, and I wrestled several shows for them, uh, shows that I weren't co- wasn't compensated for, and, you know, I wasn't asking for compensation for to mm. try to show them that I'm ready to get back out there and ready to be a part of that company, too. Mm. I also did a lot of artwork for them to show them that I was ready to contribute you know, T-shirt designs and, and things like that. And wasn't compensated for any of that stuff either. Uh, I guess right now there's just not a spot for a lash in the room on TNA roster. Mm. Um, there, hopefully there's a lot of fans out there that would hate to hear that, but that seems to be their position right now. Mm. You mentioned your art a few times. Um, where can fans see some of your art? Uh, I, well, I always have my stuff up on my website, but I work as a freelance artist. I've been in several different magazines. Uh, probably the coup de grace for me so far as a, as a cartoonist is I've actually had some cartoons published in the Saturday Evening Post. Wow. For a cartoonist is the equivalent of making it to the WWE on WrestleMania. <laughs> you know, and so they also can see it in the wrestler. I, I still do the wrestling cartoons, the lashing out cartoons like I did WCW magazine. I'm still doing it in the wrestler. Mm. And, uh, other than that, I'm doing them for several different websites. I do them for several businesses, you know, logos, that sort of thing, uh, T-shirt designs. I also have done, uh, uh, right now, as a matter of fact, when you called, I'm working on a comic book drawing of uh, uh, Hurricane, which will be on his website probably within the next week. Absolutely. That's really cool. 
That's ab- that's absolutely awesome. Um, where did you go to get schooled in such? The, or is this like a natural talent, or is this something that you went to get trained to do? I'm completely self-taught, believe it or not. Mm. Uh, actually, my re- my my cartooning didn't take off really until after I started wrestling. And a lot of these buildings that you wrestle in, uh, in the back in the locker rooms and stuff, they have the big dry race boards for the professional teams that are drawing up plays and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I, I took advantage of that, and I used to like to carry around a dry race marker with me, you know, so I could draw on there and kind of race it and everything else. And uh, Kurt Henning, God love him, <laughs> would sit back there, and, and, and of course everyone knows his reputation for being one of the great practical jokesters in our business. Mm-hmm. And he would sit back there and kind of, you know, feed me who I should draw and who, you know, here, draw this guy and, and draw him doing this, you know. And it was for his own amusement. He would just sit there and laugh, and the other guys would see it, and they would laugh. And so, long story short, uh, some of the guys from WCW Magazine saw it, asked me if I'd start doing the magazine, the cartoons for the magazine. And through doing the cartoons for the magazine, I kind of, that was my opportunity once a month to try to teach myself more and more to the point where I got where I was doing all the color work digitally in my, car, in my computer, you know, all that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. now I've, you know, that, that really doing it for five years or however long in WCW magazine really was a great uh, learning experience for me because now I'm able to churn out professional work that I've been on the cover of some truck magazine, you know, truck magazines, things like that, that I've done like just a full artwork for. Mm-hmm. So you want to continue doing that and wrestle, or do you want to devote most of your, most of your time to the artwork? Oh, I want to do both, man. Uh, and more so wrestle right now than the artwork, simply because the truth of the matter is I can only wrestle for so long before my body breaks down. But by God, I can draw these cartoons till my hand falls off. <laughs> good point, good point. And you, you mentioned your website a few times. Uh, what's the website address for that? It's LashLaRue.com. That's L-A-S-H-L-E. R O U X dot com. And, uh, there's a lot of my cartoons on there. There's also, you know, uh, I do a lot of t-shirt designs and not all of them are always last fruit t-shirts. So I'm going to try to start something in the next few months where I'm going to actually just come up with an off the wall t-shirt design, maybe a new t-shirt design every month. Uh, like one of the ones I'm featuring right now is, uh, it just simply says on the front as generic as can be future world's champ. Hey, because we all think of ourselves as the next world champ. <laughs> <laughs> good point, good point. So do you mind if we close out with some word associations? I'll basically say a name, and if you have a story, feel free. If you just have one word, that works too. Okay, works good for me, James. All right, first name on the list is Bill DeMott. Bill DeMott is probably one of the most underrated wrestlers in this business. Uh, guy's got a heart of gold. There's not anybody... In this wrestling, well, there's not anybody in my life, period, not just in the wrestling business, that I would trust more than Bill DeMont. If I got a problem, I go up to him. Uh, Bill has been a brother, he's been a teacher, and he's been a friend to me since day one for me in this business. And hey, you asked for some funny stories. Uh, Bill was actually on the road with me when I got my very first WC to be a contract. And he seemed fit to, you know, celebrate with me and make sure that I felt like I was a superstar. You know, yeah. I had finally arrived, and, and God love him. Uh, he is one of those kind of people that thinks more of the other person that he cares about more than he thinks of himself, and that's the reason why people haven't probably hasn't haven't seen him rise to the top of wrestling. Mm-hmm. Because the truth of the matter is, you know, wrestling is a very selfish business, mm-hmm. and a lot of times the unselfish people are the ones that wind up helping. The other guys become more successful, if you know what I mean. And right. I think because of the fact that he's been such a talent and he's been so unselfish, I think a lot of people have been able to become very successful people at his expense. And he's the kind of guy that is completely happy with that. Mm. Many people said that he was the locker room leader of WCW. Would you agree with that? Oh, brother, there's no question whatsoever. Uh, the truth is, I've, I've been asked many times in interviews, what was your greatest moment in wrestling? And my greatest moment was not a personal one for me. It was actually when you won the uh, United States title. Mm. And the next night on Nitro, the locker room emptied out to congratulate him. And, you know, I stood in the ring beside him. You could feel the emotion. You could feel the pride. And you could see the tears rolling down his face. And they were genuine tears because 
this wasn't some kind of angle that was booked or it wasn't something they thought would look great on TV. That was a situation where they, the wrestlers walked up to the bookers and said, we think that you deserve this kind of recognition and we want to give it to them. And, brother, you can't ask for more in this business. There's no greater accomplishment than to than to go out there and get that kind of respect of your peers. Man, mm. I, I hope that I have half that much respect for my peers when I retire. <laughs> How about Chavo Guerrero Jr.? Chavo is another tremendous talent, a tremendous friend. Uh, tagging with him was some of the most fun I had. I learned a lot from him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're talking about a guy that can not only speak from his own experiences, but when you come from a whole family of wrestlers and athletes like him, you have a lot to offer because you have a whole dynasty of wisdom in your mind when it comes to this business, and that allows him to bring a lot of unique things to the table that other people could, mm-hmm. especially not other people his age. So he's such a young guy, but has all this experience because he's been bred into it. Mm-hmm. How about somebody that was also in the uh, Misfits in Action, uh, Van Hammer? Van Hammer was a good guy with a good heart, man, and uh, maybe in a lot of ways was just, you know, too nice for the business. He's just, uh, you know, it wasn't that we didn't enjoy being a part of him being a part of the group. It was just a situation where, he seems to be a bit of a loner. He was the nicest guy in the world, but he just seemed to do a little bit better on his own than he did at the group. And, uh, that was the reasoning, you know, the reason there for the little bit of the changing of the guard there. Mm-hmm. How about somebody, I don't know if you, how much you know about her. I don't, I don't know how much you were around her. I know you worked in a match and she managed Chris Candido. How about Tammy Sitch? I really wasn't around her enough, man, to be able to, to comment, to say anything other than the fact that you know, she was always very nice and very respectful to me, and I enjoyed wrestling Chris a lot, that's for sure. Mm. How about, um, why don't I give you that name then, Chris Candido? Chris Candido, I think, was a superior wrestler, man. I think he was a super athlete. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I don't think he ever reached his full potential in this business, you know. Mm. And uh, he maybe he'll be one of those kind of guys that's been given, that'll be given another opportunity. But uh, I really think he could accomplish a lot more than he did. And that's not to say that I think he fell short or that he didn't accomplish, mm-hmm. you know, a lot. He certainly did. But I think that he had all the makings of a main eventer. How about Big Vito? Big Vito's a great guy, too. In fact, I just was on a tour with him in Germany. Mm-hmm. I just got back Sunday, and we were there for about 14 days. And it mm-hmm. was good getting to see a familiar face like him, man. Great mm-hmm. guy. He's always quick to help out and, and give a lot of advice to younger guys. And... uh you always have to be thankful and respectful to guys like that. Mm, I only have two more names for you, and one of them is Sting. Sting has always been a very nice guy to me. He's uh, always been very quick to, to, to help out, to give a lot of advice. He's a good-hearted person. He's somebody that it surprises me that he was so successful in this kind of a business like wrestling. And the reason why I say that is uh, he is such a nice guy he could have very easily been taken advantage of. You know what I mean? Yes. But, but, you know, regardless of that, he was so talented that it just made up for it. You know, I'm very surprised that somebody didn't just take advantage of him and uh, and make a lot of money at his expense with with him just kind of sitting back and just being happy to be part of the team. Because I've never seen him play any kind of a superstar card. You know what I mean? Right. You know, I've never seen a Sting walk into a room and say, look, I'm only going to do this, I'm not going to do that. Because I'm staying, I don't have to do it. That was never his attitude. Mm. He was always a team player. He was always happy to be there and happy to be a part of the show. Mm. And I always respected that, you know, for me. Mm. How about somebody that I've heard has done that, even though he's my favorite? And you mentioned that he was your favorite as a kid, Hulk Hogan. You know, I've heard a lot of those stories about Hulk Hogan also, man. I've got to tell you, every time I've been around him, I have been in awe of the fact that he's treated me with the respect that he's treated me with. I mean, you're talking about a guy that's done it all. And of all the people, I'm not selling anybody short in this business, but, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work with all the stars, everybody from Ric Flair to Sting to, you know, to Kevin Nash to Austin to The Rock. To, I've been around all of them. Right. And, you know, Hogan was the only guy that I've ever been around that you – you feel that presence, that aura of being a superstar around him. You know what I mean? Absolutely. He has that aura about him that, that he is the best and that he is the legend in this business. And, you, you know, one thing I have found out about this business, too, 
just like I was talking about with Sting, you've got a lot of promoters and a lot of people out there that are trying to take advantage of you. Hmm. So you can't ever fault a guy that, from a business standpoint, has to step up and say, look, we're going to do it like this, or I'm not going to do it at all. Hey, that's a that's a that's a decision that only the guy in that position can make, and I'm not going to ever question that because it's not my business. It is, you know what I mean? Right, absolutely. And nobody can ever take away what he's given to this business, and you know you can only thank him and respect him for it. Okay, I lied, but I just let me give you one last one here. And um, you mentioned that you were around Austin, so that made me think of this. How about Vince McMahon? Were you around him at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I worked for him. Right. Uh, I thought that. that Vince was, without a doubt, I mean, you, you, you're around him and you can just tell that, that he is, he is wrestling. Yeah. And he's proven that if, if by no other means, then, then he's proven it by the simple fact that he's been a survivor. I mean, you look around and now pretty much everyone else in North America is dead in the wrestling, you know, world except for Vince. Right. You know, Vince has been the one surviving company. Hopefully TNA can step up to the plate and that they can be another, you know, great place because it only helps the, the wrestlers for there to be more places to wrestle at. But Vince has proven that nobody's on par with him when it comes to actually conducting the wrestling business. And you got to respect that, you know. Absolutely. Well, we can't thank you enough for your time. I'll go let you watch Bill O'Reilly now. And uh... <laughs> Actually, I think we may have just missed it. Now, I'm going to finish up this work, man, and uh, I'm going to, you know, start getting ready to go back out again. I've got some shows this weekend coming up. So Where are you working? I am working in South Bend, Indiana for New Breed Wrestling. Uh, and I just got through having a little bit of a lunch break today with, uh, with Bull Buchanan, a very good friend of mine. Yep. And he and I have been talking about opening a wrestling school here in Alabama. He was actually the first guest we ever had on the show two years Bull ago. Buchanan, really? Yep, two he, years ago. I, I was, I was telling him today how I was doing the, uh, doing the interview tonight. Uh -huh. He was saying that also. He said he's done it before and in fact told me to mention to you guys you should call him up and give him an opportunity to do it again. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll have to do that. I mean, we had him on, I guess it was about February of 2003. So, yeah, it's been about almost two years since we had him on last. Wow. Well, see, what you're going to have to do is have us both on so we can talk about the wrestling school we're opening. Excellent. Well, anything you have to promote, you know how to reach us, and we'd be more than happy to help you. All right. I appreciate it, James. All right. Thank you very much. Stay tuned for more from the Interactive Interview.